So as I was told, it's a discussion, which I guess starts with you asking a question. Is that good? Lusa, what about you? Loosen up the crowd here. Yes, so are there, so okay, so I mean, so you saw the whole thing, and you, I think it presumably triggers a certain number of questions. You can ask, does this project have a future <laughs> or something? I mean, what, what do you think are directions one should develop, or what do you think one can do with this? I mean, you know, there, or could you explain a certain specific aspect? So, uh, I mean, or can you explain this even, is there an even bigger context <laughs> in the background? Yeah. So, so I only talked actually about, about one third of it. So maybe one, one quick question from, from the chairman, if I'm wrong. But the, so what we heard about was that, that should explain d squared in the zero in some sense. But what about homotopies? Yes, so... Um, Is this also explain homotopies with masculine? No, 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 no. So uh, uh, life sometimes tries to be kind. But I think there's generally no free rights. So if, if the complexity goes up, from the rise and so on. So, so what, what this, so what, what we have seen so far is that uh, it explains how to perturb uh, the Cauchy-Riemann operator in the case R cross V, which I, let's say, refer to as a homogeneous case, to some uh, modelized space, which is not a manifold, doesn't stand for manifold on all before, which can happen in certain situations. But to something which is a little bit wilder, yeah, so it's represented by smooth manifolds with weights, which globally sort of fit together. And that allows you to do uh, integration theory over it, and it allows you triangulations. So that, that is what you can do on this level. So then, so, so then you want to produce numbers out of this, then you have to deal with orientation questions. So, so you, you can't take the shortcut that I just look at zero dimensional spaces and then count them plus minus one because you destroyed that structure already by using this weighted uh, branched submanifolds. You're dealing with rational numbers, points having rational weights. So there's no way to avoid orientation questions at that point. So, so then you start happily orienting and then you see that you have actually a lot of morphisms there because I uh, did not, so I did not, I did not order the marked points, I did not order the positive punctures, and I, neither did I order the negative punctures. When you look at the SFT paper, this is give, uh, we, we, we gave this additional structure. So then you also heard about bad, bad orbits, that's also an issue. So, so it, it turns out that uh, you can go to a covering. So basically, you take that solution space which you have, and you go to a covering where you take each object, but with different numberings of the mark of the mark points, and with different uh, numbering top and bottom, and also introducing that what you have at the either intermediate phases, namely there we had this matching asymptotic markers, yeah, up to rotation. So you put on top and bottom additional markers, and then you put randomly on the set of periodic orbits. On each periodic orbit, you put a point. So the marker then on top should be, if you take the associated uh, uh, holomorphic uh, polar coordinates, if you run along r cross zero, yeah, r cross s1, and zero is sort of the one element, oh, the zero element, then uh, you, you hit that marked point. Then, if, then if it's multiple covered k times, you have k possibilities to do so, top and bottom. So then, so then, at this point, you can take uh, uh, bourgeois Mondke, and they, ha they had some ideas about orienting this. Now, when they wrote this, uh, the modelized space, technically speaking, was just a letter, because nobody really knew what it was. So they, <laughs> so, so, so they orient this letter M. Uh, <laughs> But, but when you look in the proof, so they say sort of the right thing. So, so, so you can take that, you can turn that into a proof. But surely if you interchange the order of the mark points right. or something, that has to preserve, doesn't that preserve orientations automatically? No, no, no. So, so uh, no, it depends now uh, on the, 
so for the grading, so if you make the right uh, gradings, with the, if you take the right definition of Condizina index, right. then, uh, and the right definition should have the property that if you, t if you go in the context structure at the periodic orbit and take the return map and linearize it, so then you can look at, uh, of course, uh, the linearized thing minus the identity, and that is either plus or minus this is positive, it's non-degenerate. So, so I, take the, I take the linearized return in the contact manifold, and then uh, you can look at this, and, and then you say uh, it's an even or odd depending on the sign, and the normalization of the Conlitzender index should be also so that the mod 2 reduction is precisely that. That is one of the things. Yeah? So we can talk about even and odd Conlitzender indices, and an even Conlitzender index corresponds actually to precisely the things which have a plus sign. So then, then if you interchange the so you suppose you have a numbering and the, the modular space is oriented, and then you change the numbering of two punctures. If this both belong to odd Conlitzinger in this orbit, the sign will have to change of the orientation. So here, so you, you want to know a little bit about how one orients this stuff? Okay. So, so the starting point is you want, of course, to mumble as much as possible, yeah, and leave. So, so you want to have a sort of minimalistic approach to this. So, so you, take, you take a periodic orbit. It's non-degenerate. Then J, and, or we have all this data fixed. Then we know that there is an asymptotic self-adjoint operator sitting over it. So you, you, so you, you trivialize this some way, but you can think of doing the following thing. So just put abstractly a cap there with a cauchy riemann type operator, which has precisely this asymptotics, which you have. So you choose an orientation of these things. You do this for all periodic orbits. Yeah, so these are on half, uh, so on, on disk with cylindrical end and having this operator. Okay, so, so this is a choice you make. Yeah? So here, we, so you have, there's a, you have a fretum operator there. Yeah, you linearize, so one can say a little bit about that. And you uh, have a determinant bundle and you choose an orientation. Okay, so then, then, of course, I can do the opposite. I put top caps here. So, so let, me, let me write like this. So they, are, so they are oriented because I made choices. Yeah? So these are all the choices I make where I write oriented. So now I put these caps on there. Of course, now you can do a gluing construction and get a compact surface on which you can actually destroy everything you have. You have a cauchy riemann type operator yeah, by the gluing. Now, cauchy riemann type operators can always be homotopped to complex linear operators. And that is a canonical orientation. They have canonical orientation. So, so this glued thing has a canonical orientation, which is the complex orientation. So now you only have to make one choice. Now you have to make some conventions. So you just say, so let's call this lower cap, yeah, so L. Uh, let's, let me write L plus because positive function L minus. And now you have only to think about in which order you want to write them. So let's say I write this first, and I take D, det of L plus, tensor det of L minus, goes into det of glued. But this has a complex orientation. And this is oriented. This induces an orientation here. So, so in the literature, I see this is naturally isomorphic. Of course, it would be also naturally isomorphic if I interchange the order, but then you might get different signs later on. So, 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 the, so one important thing is, whenever you see an orientation here, it's naturally, and they don't give you the convention. Actually, uh, Alexei Singer studied the, the, the higher order theory of orientations. So, so you can have many natural conventions. 
So it's good to know which one you take. So, so I, let me say I t write this first and then that. I have a one very puzzled thing because you don't, necessarily, you don't actually have disks in your manifold. So no, but it's abstractly. I just have to know, I have to just trivialize this here and then build an abstract operator ending to it. build an abstract operator. Yes. And so you do that, you choose yeah. that below and above. And then, it, so for each yeah. material... It and, they, and they have sort of, uh, there's a trivialization, so they have together with some identification here, which you fix. Yeah, so, you, you, yeah. so the orientation on the binary, yeah. I mean, the binary trivialization is okay. example, and then you... you then and now you can orient everything. So, so now, here is uh, final energy surface. Well, so I put my... So let's make this red here. So now I glue my abstractly red stuff in here, and then I glue my abstractly oriented other stuff in here. And now I have to just say, but, so, but now, now you see, suppose my punctures were, were numbered. Now you see what should be my convention, because I have to relate it with the determinant of this, determinant of this, determinant of this, determinant of this, 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 and this. And the whole thing has a complex orientation. Huh? So in principle, you would say this all should do the same than here. But I glue this in. Yeah? So, so you glue this stuff in, then it's just complex surface. is a surface with Kushirima, and you, it takes a complex orientation. But how do you do this? So, so you have to come up with a convention in which order to write my determinants. First, the lower ones, in which order the top. So, so the easiest way, of course, is if actually the punctures are ordered. If this is puncture one, two, three, four, and this is puncture, positive puncture, and here say one, two, three, four, let's say. And then you make a convention, namely, so, and this is why I have to go to the covering. So this would be my modelized space, and in the covering there are numbers. So now I make just a convention that I first write down the lower ones. So, so I write first down which has numbered one. So determinant of L1, tensor determinant plus, L2 plus, determinant L4 plus times determinant of L, uh, okay, so, uh, okay, so let's see, uh, this, so I just have to get the, uh, 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 so I have to put the surface somewhere, uh, let me see, uh, so I, okay, this, then I could write here, determinant of Let me call this W, that's that operator. You see, uh, so I would, uh, and then you could write down the determinant of L1 minus, that would be, for example, this one, then, then this one, and so on. And then if you glue this, this goes to the determinant of the glued, and this has a natural orientation, this has orientations, this has orientations, this orients that. Yeah. But you see, I could also say I put all this garbage here. Yeah, so then you get different sides later. So, so here, it's actually, so if you write this here, and then you have a building, but with a gluing, then, you, then these guys here are matching sort of with those guys, and you just have to figure out in which order they eat each other. And that is where the signs come from. So, so that's the orientation business, so you just have to know how to figure out how do uh, signs change. Ah, okay, so now, uh, this only works nicely if there's no bad orbit. So you have to, uh, otherwise, so, they, they are, they, okay, so, so let's say the basics of orientation, but there are, 
there are some issues with, um, with the asymptotic operator. So, um, yes, okay, so how, was, how did that go? Um, if you have, okay, so when I do this trivialization, in particular, I have to say where I start trivializing. So, so the marked points also play a role, the asymptotic markers. And if I have, uh, if I have an asymptotic operator, which, is, uh, which uh, is associated to a bad orbit, so a bad orbit is, is an even iterate of a simple periodic orbit, which has an odd number of eigenvalues, where the linearized map has an odd number of eigenvalues between minus one and zero. So then if you, if you take a trivialization for, th for the next marker and do this whole thing, you actually figure out you get, you get a different sign. So when you do this, but it turns out that if you, if you use any other orbit, you can, you can trivialize starting from any marker you have and you always get a consistent orientation. So, yeah. So, so the result of this is, but, but the basic feature is this, but when you carry it out, there are certain ambiguities to encounter, but they only kill you in the case of, bad or, of even iterates of bad orbits. Okay, so once, once we have this, we can do the following. We can actually orient everything which on top only has, good or has no bad orbits on top and no bad orbits on bottom. Yeah? So all the modelized spaces. They're oriented, even the broken ones. And even if the, if the, so you can do it first for buildings of height one, and then this orientation actually can be moved to the boundary. But in the boundary, what will happen is that you might have bad orbits occurring in the boundary. But, but, the whole, but then this is a broken thing, but the whole thing itself, the modular space is oriented consistently with the interior. Okay, so that's of course not good for algebra. Yeah? So, so we have all, everything oriented, then the broken thing itself is oriented, but in order to have a homology theory, we should compare it with orientations of the pieces. Yeah, like uh, if you do Mox theory, then each uh, gradient line between Mox and its difference one should have an orientation, then the modelized space in between has an orientation, and then you figure out what the signs are, right and left, and these things break. So here they can break where the individual things don't have orientations. However, the bad, what was excluded were even iterates of bad orbits. So assume we have a bad orbit, and a bad is the second iterate of a bad orbit. So then it breaks apart there. Then you, couldn't, then you just move the, so it's in particular double covered. Then you move the, one of the markers by 180 degrees. You get a new object. It's a new object. But now the boundary orientation changes. And you can glue this together like this, and it continues. So it's like billiard. So it's something like this. So you, you have ends in this picture where something runs out and this would be connected with bad orbits. And then somewhere else, it continues. And they always appear in pairs, they cancel out. So if you disregard them consistently in the theory, it does not destroy d squared equals zero. Because just that it gets stuck on the boundary doesn't mean it's actually stuck. It's just like a tunneling to a different place where it continues. So that, that is with a bad orbit. So, so they are actually not boundary points. They, they just get stuck on the boundary, but you could, could think of that there's something else from the other side glued where it continues. Questions? So, so, so something I wanted to ask is, you, your strength construction of SFT, like is, is how much is actually written down, not only for contact, 
you know, okay. also for cortisons, but what about, you know, okay. surgery okay. formulas, okay. Okay. what about okay. this package, okay. et cetera? Okay, uh, okay. so... So I answer this question, and Joel keeps track of this, uh, so he will, can make additional remarks. Okay, so so what I, de what I described today was uh, making generic perturbations a situ situation which would allow me to define a boundary operator along these lines. So then, of course, if I made a different perturbation, I get another boundary operator, and he would be interested if, the, if for example, the homologies are the same. So we would actually have to study a homotopy from one to the other, uh, which keeps the structure. So, so that was actually one of my possible endings for this course, but I, I'm usually over-optimistic, so it didn't happen. So this, uh, so, th so this has been worked out. Then, of course, what also has then to be done is you, you want to know that, on, say, in homology, it's independent of the homotopy, so you have actually to consider two different homotopies and you have to study a homotopy between homotopies. But uh, I think the, uh, the amount of difficulty, so the amount of difficulty for the transversality to today was actually surprisingly little. Yeah? So I mean, it was basically, I mean, you have to check certain things, but it's a, it, it was rather short. The, the transversality for homotoping between two such perturbations is a little bit more involved, but, uh, but it's also, you know, there are a certain number of, of things one has to point out. You cannot achieve general position and so on. You create some singularity sets, so there's a certain amount of discussion one has to go through. Then I think uh, homotopy of homotopy is quite similar. Then the next thing is you want to have cobordisms, and the cobordisms would be also a category like this, where you have positive and negative ends, and then two of such categories are operating from the right and the left by concatenations. But there, the analysis, so the analysis is completely the same then in that case, and uh, then the transversality, I think, is, is less uh, than what we have seen. Less than what we, what we could have seen if I would have been able to finish the lecture. So it, it would be more on the level of homotopy between two such perturbations. So, so it, it gets a little bit more complicated than today, but not much. So, so, th so that, that is this picture. Then you do this orientation business, and then you do. So I think you can basically do whatever we promised in, in, in the SFT paper, our differential equation. But you, you can do means there is someone who is writing it. In the yeah, yeah, like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, so uh, are you, you're more interested in time. time. Yes, uh, OK, 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 cool. yeah, I'm sure. I mean, given the experience, I might be dead at the time, and it should be coming out. But OK, so, uh, okay. so here, here's uh, the current state. So, um, so there will be two research papers. One constructs the polyfolds for, for all the categories occurring. It also has a list, actually useful number of uh, techniques in it to build such spaces. For example, one of, one of the criticisms one can have about the analysis with the, with, with the usual gluing constructions is that you have to do a gluing construction at once. There's no local version of this. You have to set up the thing, then you do the gluing. And we know that this thing is very long, so you do finite dimensional reductions, it's not natural. So, and then you have to do, there's a lot of things you have to do, and it's usually so long that an author tries to avoid actually writing it down, unless a referee forces the author. So then, then, then there are different versions of shortcuts by saying a slight modification of any point in another paper, where then you look at it, it's actually not there, and the author points to something else. So, so, that's, so that is, uh, basically in the nature of things. So what, what we are coming up with is something like this. You want to introduce, for example, the notion of a pre fretton theory. That means if I would know that I have to say, so if I would know for some reason, because somebody at some point proved this, that if I have a Cauchy-Riemann operator on something without actually having boundary condition, it satisfies certain things. Yeah, it cannot be fretter because there are no boundary conditions. Then, if and but but that I can put a stamp on it, it's pre fretter Then, if I have some other situations, and this is pre fretter and, and I can sort of identify these things, I could say this is pre fretter Then, if I could take this stuff and glue it onto this one, and there's no free end anymore, I could conclude it's fretter on the nonlinear level. 
So the picture then is actually drawing. So if you study things like this, then you could say there are sort of regions of identification. And you could represent this by a graph like this. So this thing like a graph like this, and the other like a graph like this, where you can identify this here. So you could draw this picture. And there's no free and it's, it's fraternal. And if you have, so you could think of pictures like this, where each of this is some piece of nonlinear analysis, uh, of, of freedom analysis, for example, this. Gluing, gluing near node, yeah? the freedom operator nearby. So if I understand this, and I understand the tube, yeah, which is obviously quite trivial, then if I take a color here, and I can identify this, and I can identify this, then I have already a theory for a sphere with sort of a node. Yeah? So, so then, once you have this, you actually you can build a library of pre You can build a library where if a if, if, if person proves a new piece of analysis, and it is, it is built up to certain specifications, you can plug that into the machinery and it works. So you can start recycling things. So for example, if you start all this and then somebody does this here, this is a piece of arc, and on this you have Kocher Riemann, and this you have the gradient flow, and proves it's pre fredholm then you can plug that into the game. Yeah, if you, so there are certain constructions like PSS morphism or something like this, they maybe look. Yeah? Can you say what the conditions are for being pre uh, but not on a satisfactory level. So, so on the level of, of the operators, I could, but it takes a little bit of a while. But uh, so still completing what, what should be, there, there should be, I, it's pretty certain there's an abstract theory. So basically, pre fretheim is something that you can glue something to it that it's fretheim. <laughs> plus, plus some small print. So that this is, so, so suppose you have an operator on this. And you say it's pre home because I can glue some, because, for example, I can put Lagrangian boundary conditions on that boundary. Yeah? And then suppose we have something here. And this is also fret home because I can put Lagrangian boundary conditions on it. And then currently we, we are building a switch. And the switch is something like this. So this here, so. So we, we sort of suppose this area looks pretty much like this area. Then, we, then, then you want to switch from gluing this part together with that part, and this part together with that part. And that would be a product of two Fretum operators. And you would have proved that if this is Fretum is Lagrange and this, then this here to glue together, together with this, with this one, with the Lagrange boundary condition here and here, the product is Fretum. So therefore, that is Fretum. So this is actually known on the, on the linear level, so the excision formula and Atia Singer index and so on. But I think there is, there's a nonlinear version of this. But we're getting carried away now. So, OK, so, and so that would be one thing for the Fretheim theory. And the other is actually constructing spaces out of small things. So when I construct polyfolds, so I, I can construct a polyfold for that piece, a polyfold for this piece, and then that, that the things uh, overlap in this harmless piece is, is a fibered product condition. So there's also a theory putting these things together. So at the end of the, so at the, end of the day, there's, I mean, you know, there's still some work to be done. But if you, so you look at the problem, you have to develop sort of an idea about sort of the moving parts. And then you can put this into small pieces, build fibered products, and you get, you get the uniformizers. Then you look at the Koshi Riemann, you chop it into pieces. If, then each identifiable piece is pre-Fretholm and is in your library, then that thing is Fretholm. So, and, and, and then, sorry, again, the big picture, then the expectation is once, once it's all out there, then people will start Hopefully, moving, yes. making versions of like surgical right. paper and things like that using that language. Right. Be because I, I, I think one of the advantages of the theory is actually that it, that it can be chopped into smaller pieces. I think th that, that is actually a, a useful feature. And, uh, and so then, then the pieces of analysis, since you only, you know, in principle, then if you have such a situation and you, and you just cover it by open sets, and for each open set, you could say the restriction is pre fretheim and then if it's all covered, then the thing has to be fretheim if, if it would go in this direction. 
then, then uh, yeah, then on small patches, I mean, you may always assume the image is R to N. So there's some, usually some estimate for something on a small disk or near a node into some Rn, and you have to prove something about this. And then it gets, uh, then if this is proved, then it gets a stamp pre fretholm which is a list, a catalog of properties. And if you have another one, under, you can start gluing these things together. So, so you'll be able to use this machinery in a more or less axiomatic way without actually having to understand all the technicalities, or will you actually have to understand you could actually, I mean, all of the technicalities to use it? Well, I think the technicalities on this microscopic level are usually rather similar. I mean, like gluing at nodes, gluing at periodic orbits. So I think it's good in, in life to see at once what enters, yeah? But then I think uh, things are quite similar. But I think on the level of consumer of such a technology, you know, I, I would definitely look a little bit into the machinery. I mean, like at a car, I would open the hood and see at least a little bit what is in there. I mean, maybe I don't want to know too much about the electronics, but you know, I want to see, <laughs> I want to see some parts. And then, so, uh, so the, then, my, so for example, we, we wrote this Gromov of Witten thing, uh, with the and which is sort of written not in this language. It, it is written rather down to earth with, with a little bit of this polyfold technology. It has a certain length, but it definitely addresses all the issues. So you see what the problems are, how you address it, and then you, you get a solution. So, so it's sort of good to at least see it once. So, so the SFT paper now, which is sort of the next thing which comes out, just doesn't take any prisoners. Yeah, we just use that technology, construct the things. So there are two papers, this is what I just said about construction of the spaces. And then, then you start precisely where my lecture starts. I have these categories, there are smooth structures on this, and I just talk about uh, the, uh, the algorithms for the perturbations and how orientations and, and, do the, and show what, what kind of invariants you can do with this. Yeah? So just then deliver SFT. But, uh, what, uh, but it's also interesting to note that from this level of generality, you see that there should be other things you should be able to do. Because on this category, for example, I, ha I have SC differential forms. Example of this are the pullbacks by evaluation. Once I have these mark points numbered, I can pull back. So I have to take a covering of, of the category here by adding these numberings and so on, which is also has a smooth structure. So then you start pulling back differential forms from the, 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 the contact manifold, or you, you have a map into the lin mumford space by forgetting the map, then throwing away the, the unstable domain components, and you can pull back differential forms from the Delenn De Mumford stack of, uh, of stable human surfaces. There will be examples of uh, differential forms on the category, and then using those, you construct this most general form of SFT. But you could also think, well, why do I not just take the Deram complex on the category and integrate? Now, these forms will have less symmetry properties because when I pull back at mark points, the other forms, I know sort of when I renumber the mark points and, and pull this back in different order, I just have a sign change, which I can predict yeah, when I integrate these forms. But, but uh, this you will not have if you do other things. But it, it could very well be that these differential forms, that there are plenty of them which dis discover something of the topology of the spaces of the underlying orbit spaces. And that, that are more than this, this forms used so far. You know, so I, I think it is a, view, a good viewpoint that one should separate out the analysis. You do this, then you have smooth structures on the category, and then you do just a lot of general procedures on that level. That produces you some numbers at the end, and then some some numerical objects, algebraic objects, and then you start thinking about how can I represent this data in some algebraic fashion. And from that perspective, contact uh, homology and cylindrical and so on are possibilities you have in, in particular circumstances to do. But, but of course, when we wrote these papers, we were, we, we were sort of brainwashed by life. Yeah? So, so like there was Fleur theory, and then when, once Fleur theory was there, everybody who saw a problem where there should be Fleur theory had immediately the immediate right instinct what to do, precisely more or less this idea and take it. But I think. One should, one should view it to, f from today's perspective, since you can separate it all out, there might be a lot of other algebraic things you can do. 
So, so then you can think about other structures on the category. So I have this, evalu this evaluation maps plus minus. You could have maybe categories which have more things coming out. So you can glue different categories in different ways together, yeah? not just a plus and a minus. Just combinatorial configurations of categories to do certain things. And I'm pretty sure there are, of course, uh, oh, I, oh. anyway, so I'm sure there are applications for this kind of things. Oh, sorry, so like you said, basically you can recast all the theories so far. Well, I haven't checked all the theories, but. No, no, but like, you know, so, it should work. So, yeah. So I think I mean I think I could you know I, there's no analytic obstruction for not doing uh, studying Lagrangian boundary conditions and and, and put that in, into the frame and and, and 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 sort of exhibiting this kind of structure that you can if different ends can glue at all different places and so on so I think there are a lot of different structures on the level of categories you can think of and there might be realizations as this kind of modular modular problems also. I think a lot of mileage in symplectic geometry you get by actually artificially creating new type of operators and things just to, 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 to prove some geometric fact by counting some weird modelized space. Yeah. So, so if you see sort of that, that you can put the things in smaller pieces, so it becomes more like a puzzle that you put things together and so on. So, so at least the language gives you the freedom. I, I, don't, I, I mean, I haven't thought too much about it except carrying out this SFT. Yeah, so. But, but, but I say the optimist I am, so I, I would think that, that it should be some kind of like domino pieces. You can put them together and blah, 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 and then you build certain things out of this. And then you get some numbers, you represent something, and then you sort of look at represents some geometric fact. And, and the constructions will be much faster than if you have such complicated thing you have going through all kinds of other things. In particular, I think when, when you have this pre fretholm theory. So yeah, I think that, sorry, just to finish answering your question, uh, as you asked a few, I think. Uh, so I, 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 so I, my understanding is that if it's in sort of the SFT propaganda paper, then, you know, Helmut and co-authors will make sure that uh, it's backed up with uh, all the appropriate theories. So that will be done. If you want additional theories to come out of HWZ or, any, or, or, or Helmut and company, uh, then, uh, then uh, you don't expect that. So if you want a more spot theory, I wouldn't expect to see that to come out of Helmut and company, right? No, I do other stuff. I, I'm sh you can do it, but you have to do a little piece. But also here. Uh, so let me just finish. Uh, yeah. So uh, Right, so, so they, they, I think Helmut really wants to make everything in that propaganda paper absolutely rigorous and then sort of move on to other more interesting projects. But the part of doing that means, you know, so, so in SFT you have, so one unfortunate bit is that you have at least two different types of degenerations that can happen. Nodal sort of degenerations, like can happen to Grandma Witten, and then sort of breaking, like you might see in floor. And so when it comes down time to build charts, you don't want to have to keep track of these things, you know, very separately and rewrite new charts from the beginning. So part of the abstract package is to localize that analysis so that once you have two little, two bits and pieces, you can fit them together very rapidly and then sort of extend the theory on to sort of other things. And, I, and, and my understanding is that the hope is that this will be done to sort of such a level that if you sort of say, ah, I have this new problem, it hasn't been solved before, that there's a small bit of sort of standard analysis that will have to be done, sort of essentially understanding breaking or noting a new phenomena that hasn't been studied. This is sort of step one, so you do a bit of new analysis, it's not so difficult. And then you have to sort of, then after you've done that, the polyfold for your problem should effectively be done. You cite appropriate results and it's just boom, suddenly you've got this big ambient space where you can perturb. But then I think there is sort of hard work to be done, relatively hard work to be done, which is to say, okay, you know, now I want to see an algebra or something to pop out of this. And so if I, and, and, and getting that algebra to sort of fall out of your, for your perturbed moduli spaces, like the way that this will occur is by making sure that you can choose your perturbations in such a way that everything is compatible. And this takes a bit of work. Not, it's not an analysis work, it's like the, the sort of work that was given in the, in, in the past several lectures, right? It's, it's the sort of thing that you can, you can work on and think about without having to work and worry about the analysis, right? Uh, directly, and that I think is accessible uh, to you know a, a fairly large range of people. Once you at least seen it done, you know, in one instance, and then you might have to be creative to set it up in a very other, in a, in a very different framework, right? But not so much analysis. And right, right. Once yeah. the package is finished. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a clean way to think about it. Even if you don't li then like the methods, and you come up with your own methods, you, you definitely, if you're not, so so the thing is, it's like domino. You put things together. 
and uh, behind there should be a COE. Now, if you don't believe this, at least you can write it down and see what the results should be, and then you prove it by a different method. Yeah? So, <laughs> but, the one, uh, but the question is it really, uh, then you are, have to make a decision, do I want to use a different method or just learn the language here? That's presumably the easier way to do it. But, but sorry, so, so I understand, if, if, if I know what, what algebraic structure I should be getting out of whatever construction I'm, I'm doing, should this perturbation algorithm let you? Yes, yeah, you, so will need to, you will need to find the, the you will need to find the right sort of you don't have the sort of the general polyfold sort of framework, but I mean as you saw, you know, Helmut, for instance, in, in the SFT stuff, you have to deal with these sort of covering functors, right? Yeah, these covering functors because sometimes you want to keep track of, of, of asymptotic markers and so forth. And there inevitably is going to be something sort of similar in whatever approach you want to deal with, right? So you need to find the you know the right sort of uh, the right sort of uh, polyfold to build, but you'll end up building it out of these parts that have already been that have sort of come for free. And then once you've made this big construction, then you have to sort of construct your, yeah, you have to construct the perturbations to make sure that you get the algebra out that you want, right? And that's, that's sort of on you to, 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 to manage, but that's, but, but HLBC mean, should guarantee, it should effectively guarantee sort of the transversality part for you, but you know, you're still gonna have to construct these perturbations so they satisfy all the appropriate compatibility conditions which guarantee your algebra. I mean, you, you have all this, well, you have this inter, well, I mean, here, so when you look at the algorithm, so there are a lot of things which if I perturb here like this, then this piece of perturbation appears all up everywhere because whenever I go to a new phase, it appears as a product and then later it's being reused and so on. So, so that might in, in, in some problems lead to uh, genericity issues. Yeah? I mean, here it doesn't yeah, for the the op for the boundary operator, but you could imagine that, that there are certain things that you have so many conditions that you run into difficulties doing so. So then it could be that at the end then you, you have to allow for certain mistakes, yeah, from, you have to allow for more general perturbations, and then you get some kind of higher structure which keep track of, of the lack of being actually able to be keeping all the structures being transversal. Yeah, you get, say, you know, higher, these higher level structures where the mistake you have to make to get a theory on the level, at least so much transversality that you need to do something, might still need to break the symmetry, but then there are different ways to break the symmetry and you keep track of the different ways to break the symmetry. And then you go to the next level. And that is an algebraic object, yeah? yeah so, yeah, so I think you you know when you when you want to intersect the diagonal or what you, you just break the symmetry also. I, I think uh, I mean, like like the Ram theory, the Ram cohomology is on the level of of the co chains is a product, whereas singular isn't. So they have to perturb and keep track of it. So 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 I don't know here in this way, but but I, I could imagine. I mean, if I just put so much structures on this, I cannot just achieve standard regularity, so, so I have to break, to break uh, I have to give up some of the structures. But, th but I think in general, then there, is an, uh, there's, there could be in the background an algebraic theory of in which way you can give up this structure. And then you keep track of this and you build your way up and you have a new mathematical object, yeah? So. So in about Morse bot, you just said it's, it should work, but it's just too. Yeah, so, so in Morse bot then, so, so here, in this case, of course, one part is the gluing at periodic orbit. So I have to understand that picture in the analysis and then glue this in. So if it's Morse bot, well, then in the neighborhood, so if this is a Morse bot manifold, you would at least describe some analysis here. So it depends now how you want to deal with this. Yeah? So some people like to put a Morse function on this here, but you could also, I guess, have this ends running around and, and, and build homology classes by evaluation at the ends, and they have to intersect with the other, or something like this. So, so it depends how you want to approach this. But, but the, the, the end result is presumably building, so, so this here becomes a little black box, which looks like this. And then if I have something else, which I worked on, I glue this together, <laughs> something here, and build this into the other thing. So, so you have to build a black box here, which does sort of the right thing inside and then glue it into the other things. Will be explained on examples how to do that, this black box business. 
So I, I'm still a bit unclear about the role of SC calculus in all this. <laughs> okay, so okay, there's the reparameterization action problem. And the retracts. Yeah, so, okay, so, so the, okay, so when, so when we decided to deal with a setup on which we want to, a freedom setup on which we want to work, then our decision was that on the domains and everywhere, we want to have local constructions, very local. I mean, you could imagine if you have a space of maps from surfaces which also uh, can be glued, you could think of putting a structure on there which is being obtained by solving some PDEs and so on, which would not be of local nature. Huh? So what we want to have is that, that there's a locality to this. If I know the local properties around the nodes everywhere, I can recover from this the structure of the space. Yeah? That is what makes it possible that, that you can chop it into pieces. It's complete. These are just always pointwise things. Then near, near the nodes, we cause, of course, glue, and we have to deal with the problem that we get different domains. Yeah? So, so then, when you, when you want to have this function spaces or this topological space which has this very local property, then, um, then there seems to be no Banach space up, set up for modeling it. Even if I would only have interior nodes and no breaking. This, the, the, the space of maps, which are defined on a node, and you want to describe the neighborhood where you glue the cylinders, can, as far as I, I can see, cannot be modeled on an, on a, on an open set in a Banach space. So, so therefore, so, when, so, so then the, in our, so while exploring this, then there was the idea of uh, putting this anti-gluing in, and then you, you got some kind of a messy subspace on which, on which you could define a chart, yeah, which, which then later turned out to be the retract, and the retract then turned out for the SC smooth structure to be a smooth map for the new smooth, for the SC calculus. So we had actually a smooth model for the spaces, but it was actually a retract. So the retract is also not smooth in the classical sense. No, no, absolutely not. If, if, there, if, there, if there would be a smooth map onto this retract, this retract would actually be a Banach submanifold. But it has actually varying dimensions. So, uh -huh. okay. so th that is very, uh, so. So in the classical theory, that's actually Henri Carton's last theorem in the Comte Rendu. So it was definitely his last ma mathematically published work, um, which, however, I, I only learned later from by. Uh, uh, it and Gis. So, so he proved that if you have, if you have uh, in a Banach space a map R which is smooth from the open set into itself and R, R composed with R is equal R, that the image is a Banach space, is a Banach submanifold. So that is what he proved. And what we had figured out is also we had <laughs> figured this also out because we realized first there was a retraction and it was differentiable for, for this SC calculus. But then, of course, the natural question, what is, what is it actually if it's classically smooth? Yeah? Then we also, had also figured out that it has to be a Banach submanifold. But, um, but in, uh, for the SC retractions in general, it is not the case. So it, 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 it is a wilder space. But then, and th then of course, uh, once you know this, that if you have smooth retractions, for, for any notion of differentiability, and you have the chain rule so that you can do this, then you can build a theory based on this. You can take the, the images of the retraction as a local model. So there might be actually even different forms of differentiability with what you would like to try this. So you can. Yeah, so, so then, it, then it, so once you had, so, so this concept was born out looking at periodic orbits, looking at periodic orbits at nodes and so on, and it turned out to be rather useful. And I think, and I made that remark before, that, that maybe even classical differential geometry should be made with retracts, because a lot of stuff is, is simple. So, so if I, So for example, when I have so, uh, 
So nobody would really like to define this as a submanifold, you know, classically, because the positions is. So if you, if you take a differential geometry book, they definitely want to avoid to say that there's a submanifold. But this yellow subset is a local retract. Around each point, you have a retraction. So, so the better definition would be to say a submanifold is one which is, a, is the image of a classically smooth retraction. And then this is all fine. It has a tangent space. It's, it's a manifold structure. The only thing what you can't say in general in high dimensions, you cannot say that the boundary is a submanifold because it might be rather wild. However, if you know that on the boundary, the tangent space is a nice position to the whole thing, then it has a nice structure. So you can say, if, if it, for example, cuts it like this, or the higher dimensional versions, then you know the inducing is a, is a manifold with boundary and corners. So retracts are actually useful, so if you build it on this, and, and then if you want to build manifold of maps, that goes really fast. So, so suppose, so you have the Banach, so it's not a home cohomology group, that's a Banach space, a Hilbert space of maps into some Rn. And, uh, and the only thing you have to know is if I have a smooth map from Rn into Rm, it, this is a, is a fact here, then of course you get a smooth map by composition into this. Yeah? So that's a classical theory. So, so now, so I claim, so, and this is functorial, yeah? So to every index n, you have a Hilbert space, and for a smooth map from Rn into Rm, you get an induced smooth operator between these Hilbert spaces. This thing has a canonical extension to manifolds. So what do you do? So what's S here? There's S? S. Oh, or well, some say Riemann in surface. A Riemann so, so now suppose I have a manifold. You can embed the manifold into a sufficiently large Rn. So suppose it's a compact manifold. If not, you have to properly embed it. But let's say compact manifold. Here's my Rn. Here's a manifold. Take a tuber neighborhood here, Whitney tuber neighborhood, and then you, there's a retraction from this neighborhood into itself where the image is a manifold. So now, this one, by restricting it a little bit smaller, you can extend to a map. So by cutting it near the bound, in a, in a slightly, so by restricting it to a slightly smaller neighborhood, you may assume this is a restriction from a map from uh, Rn into Rn. So, so now you take the open subset of this thing here where the image lies in that small neighborhood. Yeah, so, so take the subset, so take all u's in H3 of S R n, where the image of S lies in that neighborhood. This is an open subset of the, uh, the space, and define R twiddle by R twiddle of u is R composed with u. But since it's a restriction of a smooth map, that's a smooth map, and it has a property R squared equals zero. And what are, the, what are in the images are all maps which go into M. So therefore, this is at least a polyfold, an M polyfold. Yeah? So, <laughs> so, so now, take a different embedding into some other RN. Then on the two embeddings, you have a diffeomorphism, and you extend it in both directions to a smooth map. So you see that the two things are actually SC diffeomorphic. So therefore, the, the abstract space of all maps into M, which together with an embedding R and R3, has a well-defined M polyfold structure. And then you think a little bit, and you see it's actually an SC manifold structure that rather than taking retracts, you can take SC spaces as a model. So, is also not no, 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 actually in this case, it's even classically smooth on each level. So, so, so in this case, actually on H3, so, so here I don't even have a scale here. This is classically smooth. So this is a smooth Hilbert space. I mean, it's actually, it's, it, you, you see, it's actually a classical, it's, it's a polyfold structure for classical retraction. And by Cartan theorem, it is actually 
a Hilbert submanifold. So what did you say at the end? You muttered something about... Um, <laughs> So, so one thing I said, if you, it might depend on the embedding. If you take a different embedding, then of course the two embedded things by this map are diffeomorphic. Then for each of them, you take a, take a smooth extension, just as a smooth map, right and left. You said it was not an M polyfold structure, but it was modeled on S. No, 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 no. I didn't say it was. No, it's not. So, so here, this is just classical smoothness. So forget. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so what this proves is that the that the space of that there's a subset of maps from S into Rn of class H3, which has the image in M, is a classical retract for the classic differentiable structure, and therefore a Hilbert space, Hilbert manifold. And this definition doesn't depend on the embedding. You just look at the maps into M, which together with an embedding have this property. And if you take a different embedding, they're, they're, the structures are diffeomorphic. So it's a canonical construction. Yeah. So, so, so in, the, in the literature, usually people write more about it. So that's, I think, the shortest proof of, of actually putting structure on this. Yeah, so, but anyway, so retractions is good stuff. Three minutes to closing. <laughs> Last round. Thank you. And uh, as on the scientific committee and organizers, so I think at the end we should give a uh, really big applause to the RGS who made this possible and all the help we achieved. Also to our organizers, where I only see uh, so Joe this. Oh, Dan and Joel, and to to Joe, Joe, who did a lot of work as a chair of the committee and had to go to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so, so.